Selling things online always comes with risks. You never know who's on the other side of the transaction or what their real intentions are. I had used Craigslist plenty of times before without any issues, so when I decided to sell my old bike, Craigslist seemed like the obvious choice. I had outgrown the bike in more ways than one, but it was still in good condition, just not practical for the kind of biking I was doing now. I posted some pictures, wrote up a description, and set a fair price. Within a day, I got a response from someone named Jeffrey. He said he was interested and wanted to come by to take a look. Simple enough, right? I didn't think twice about inviting him over. I had done this before, usually people came, checked out the item, and either bought it or didn't. Easy. But this time was different. Jeffrey seemed eager, messaging me throughout the day with questions about the bike, how well it rode, if there were any problems, and when would be a good time to swing by. I answered everything, and we agreed he'd come by around 7 p.m. that evening. It was fall. So the sun was already setting, but I didn't mind the timing. Besides, I figured an evening sale might be easier since there'd be fewer people around, less noise, less hassle. My neighborhood was safe, or at least it had always felt that way. I was comfortable. I prepped the bike, cleaned it up a bit, and rolled it out into the front yard. It was one of those cooler evenings with a light breeze and that crisp smell of autumn in the air. I checked my phone, Jeffrey was on his way. A little after 7 p.m., a car pulled up in front of my house. Not just Jeffrey, three guys stepped out. The moment I saw them, I felt a pang of unease. Jeffrey hadn't mentioned bringing anyone with him, and none of them looked like the kind of person who'd be interested in a bike. They were big, broad-shouldered, and dressed casually. I tried not to judge too quickly. Maybe Jeffrey had just brought some friends along for the ride, but deep down I knew something wasn't right. One of the guys waved at me as they approached, smiling. He introduced himself as Jeffrey, but his voice didn't match the casual tone of the messages. His smile fell forced. The other two guys hung back a bit, not saying anything. Hey, Jeffrey said, his eyes scanning the bike. This the one. I nodded, trying to keep things light. Yep, that's it. Just tuned it up yesterday. Want to take it for a spin. One of the guys stepped forward, looking at the bike like he didn't even care about it. He was more interested in the house, looking at the front door, then back at me. That's when the second guy spoke up. Mind if I use your bathroom real quick. And that threw me off. I wasn't expecting anyone to ask to come inside, but it wasn't the first time someone had needed to use the bathroom during a sale, so I figured it wasn't that weird. Sure, I said, motioning toward the door, just straight through the hallway. I kept my eyes on the two guys standing outside as the third one walked into the house. They were acting casual, but it felt forced, like they were waiting for something. Jeffrey kept talking about the bike, asking if it had been in any accidents, but I could tell he wasn't really interested in my answers. His eyes kept shifting between me and the house, like he was waiting for a signal. That's when I realized the guy who had gone inside had been gone way too long. I excused myself, telling Jeffrey I needed to check something real quick inside. The moment I stepped into the house, I noticed it was too quiet, no sound of footsteps, no flushing toilet, just silence. I walked through the hallway, past the bathroom, and saw the door was slightly ajar empty. Panic hit me then. Where was he? I turned and headed toward the living room, my heart quickening as I searched the space. Then I saw a movement the back door was slightly open, like someone had slipped out. I could feel my heart racing. I moved toward the door, not sure what I was going to find, when I heard the faintest creak from the floor above me. He was upstairs, and he had no reason to be there. I didn't think I just acted. I bolted toward the front door, 
adrenaline kicking in. As I reached the doorway, one of the guys stepped in front of me, blocking my exit. He didn't say anything, just stood there with this blank expression, his hands at his sides like he was ready to stop me if I tried to push past. Everything all right, man Jeffrey asked from behind me, his voice calm but with an edge that made my skin crawl. I think you guys should leave, I said, trying to sound firm, but my voice wavered. Jeffrey took a step closer. We're not done looking at the bike, are we? My gut screamed at me to do something, but I was trapped one guy in the house, another blocking the door, and Jeffrey closing in. I looked toward the staircase, hoping to catch sight of the third guy, but there was nothing. Just the growing realization that I had let these strangers into my house, and now I was paying for it. Suddenly I heard a loud thud from upstairs, followed by footsteps fast and heavy. Whoever was up there wasn't hiding anymore. Without thinking, I lunged for the side door leading to the garage. The guy blocking the front door moved to grab me, but I escaped. I sprinted through the garage, fumbling for the remote to open the overhead door. As it slowly cranked upward, I could hear footsteps behind me getting closer. The door wasn't even halfway up when I ducked and rolled under it, scraping my arms on the concrete as I scrambled to my feet. I heard the garage door slam shut behind me just as I burst into the driveway, running from my neighbor's house. I pounded on their door, yelling for help, praying someone was home. After what felt like an eternity, the door swung open and my neighbor, an older guy named Jack, stepped out. There in my house I shouted, Call the cops. The police arrived in minutes, but by the time they got there, the three men were gone. They had taken a few things, some cash, my wallet, and an old iPad I didn't use much. But the real loss was the sense of safety I'd always felt in my own home. The cops told me I was lucky it could have been much worse. They had seen scams like this before people posing as buyers to scope out houses, waiting for the right moment to rob or worse. The fact that I had gotten out when I did probably saved me from something more dangerous. I spent the next few days on edge, jumping at every little noise. I couldn't stop thinking about what could have happened if I hadn't made that run for the garage. I never sold anything on Craigslist again. That bike? I gave it away for free. I had just moved into my new apartment in Julian, California, and like anyone trying to save a few bucks, I was constantly browsing Craigslist for cheap or free furniture you'd be surprised at what people are willing to give away. A few days into my search, I came across an ad for a Maplewood TV stand. The pictures made it look solid and well-made, almost new, and best of all, it was free. The seller, Anna, didn't give much information beyond pickup required, must take today. I figured it was worth checking out, I mean it was free after all. I sent a quick text to the number in the ad, asking if the TV stand was still available. The response came almost instantly, yes, it's still here. Are you able to pick it up today? I replied with a quick, yeah, that works, and asked for the address. She sent it over along with a weirdly specific instruction, I won't be home, but the door will be unlocked. Just go in and take the stand. That gave me pause. I don't know about you, but something about walking into a stranger's house while they weren't there didn't feel right at all. I didn't want to seem paranoid, though, and it wasn't like I hadn't seen stranger stuff on Craigslist before. Maybe she was at work and just didn't have time to be there for the pickup. So against my better judgment, I agreed. The address was a bit out of the way, where the houses are more spread out and there's a lot of open land, it wasn't the most populated area, but it wasn't totally isolated, either one of those places where you'd feel safe during the day, but not so much at night. The drive was chill at the beginning, nothing unusual. 
The roads were familiar, and I had my music on, trying to relax. But as I got closer, things started to feel different. The sun was starting to set as I pulled into the driveway of what looked like a typical suburban home, though it had clearly seen better days. The front yard was overgrown with weeds creeping up onto the cracked concrete walkway. There was no car in the driveway, just the house sitting there, quiet and still. I turned off the car and stared at the place for a second. The porch light flickered weakly, as if it was on its last leg, and the whole thing just had this vibe, you know? That feeling when you step into a place and it feels like something's watching you, even though there's no one around. That's what hit me the moment I parked. Still, I wasn't about to back out now. It was just a TV stand, and I figured I'd be in and out. I texted Anna again to let her know I had arrived but didn't get a reply. No big deal, she had said she wouldn't be home, after all. I got out of the car, walked up to the front door, and just like she said, it was unlocked. I pushed it open and stepped inside. The moment I entered, I was hit by this heavy, musty smell. It wasn't exactly foul, but it definitely wasn't the smell of a house someone had been living in recently. The air felt stale, like it hadn't been aired out in a while. I stood in the entryway for a moment, letting my eyes adjust to the dim light. The house was eerily quiet except for a faint creaking sound that I assumed was just the old wooden floors settling. I did my best to shake off the weird feeling creeping up on me it was an old house. Old houses made noises, right? I took a deep breath and stepped further inside. There wasn't much furniture in the living room, just an old couch and a coffee table that looked like it had seen better days. The TV stand the one I was here to pick up was sitting against the far wall. It was bigger than I expected, solid wood like the ad said but it didn't look like something someone would just give away for free. I looked around the room, feeling more and more out of place. The house didn't feel lived in. There were no pictures on the walls, no decorations, nothing that made it seem like anyone had called this place home for a while. Just as I was about to head over to the TV stand, I heard something. It was faint, almost like a whisper, but unmistakable a woman's voice coming from upstairs. I froze. At first I thought maybe I was hearing things, maybe it was the wind, or maybe I was just imagining things because of the way this place felt. But then I heard it again, a little louder this time, hello, is someone there? It was unmistakably a woman's voice, but something about it didn't sit right with me. It was too soft, too distant like it wasn't coming from someone standing in a room, but from somewhere further away. I took a deep breath and called out Anna. No response. My pulse was quickening, and I wasn't sure what to do. Anna had said she wouldn't be home, so who was upstairs? Part of me wanted to get the hell out of there right then, but the other part, the part that didn't want to seem like a coward, kept me rooted to the spot. Maybe she had come home after all. Maybe it was nothing. But then why wouldn't she have responded to my text? I looked up toward the stairs, and that's when I saw at the shadow of feet, just visible from the landing. Someone was standing there just out of sight. My heart jumped into my throat. The feet didn't move, didn't shift. They were just standing there like whoever it was was waiting for me to come up. That voice echoed in my head again, but now it sounded wrong hollow. Suddenly I realized the voice I'd heard wasn't quite right. It had sounded like a woman at first, but now, thinking back, there was something off about it. It was too deep, almost like someone trying to imitate a woman's voice. My gut twisted, and I knew without a doubt that whatever was upstairs wasn't Anna. Before I could react, the feet moved quick, heavy footsteps started toward the stairs. The door at the top of the stairs swung open, slamming against the wall, and I didn't wait to see what was coming down. 
I bolted for the front door. My feet slipped on the dusty floor, and I nearly fell as I grabbed the door handle and yanked it open. Behind me, I heard a voice deep, angry, nothing like the soft Anna I'd heard before. Where do you think you're going? I didn't answer. I flew out of the house, practically leaping down the porch steps, and sprinted to my car. I struggled with the keys, my hands shaking, before finally getting them into the ignition. I started the car and sped out of the driveway. I didn't slow down until I was miles down the road, surrounded by street lights and traffic again. I pulled into a gas station parking lot and just sat there for a minute, trying to catch my breath. I grabbed my phone and looked at the text thread with Anna no new messages, no explanation for what I had just experienced. I blocked the number immediately. I thought about reporting the whole thing to the police, but what would I say? That I heard a creepy voice and saw someone's feet? That I nearly walked into what exactly is set up? A trap? I didn't have any answers, and honestly, I wasn't sure I wanted any. And even though I got away, I can't stop thinking about what would have happened if I'd been just a little slower, if I hadn't listened to my gut when I realized that voice wasn't right. I'd been trying to break into modeling for a while, nothing serious, just some small gigs and Instagram collaborations. I needed professional headshots, something more polished to send to agencies. So like any broke aspiring model, I started looking for photographers on Craigslist. I know it's not the safest option, but when you're on a budget, you don't have many choices. That's how I came across Leo. His ad was simple professional photographer looking to expand portfolio, offering discounted rates for headshots. He had a couple of sample photos in the listing, and they looked legitimate, nothing too flashy, just well-lit, clean portraits of people who didn't look overly posed. I figured it was worth checking out. I emailed him, and he replied saying he had an opening later that week. We arranged to meet at his studio, which he said was in a part of town I wasn't super familiar with, but wasn't too far from the city center. Everything seemed fine, and honestly I was just excited to get some professional shots without spending a fortune. But looking back, there were a few things that should have been red flags. The day of the shoot, I drove out to the address Leo had given me. The neighborhood was not what I expected. It wasn't exactly run down, but it had that abandoned warehouse vibe like a place where businesses had thrived once but hadn't been touched in years. A lot of the buildings were old and crumbling, and there wasn't much foot traffic. Most of the shops were closed with faded for lease signs in the windows. Leo's studio was in one of those buildings, a cramped two-story office that screamed 80s vibes, like it hadn't been updated in decades. The paint was peeling, and the windows were covered with grime. There wasn't even a sign outside, just the building number, faded and barely visible. I double-checked the address he'd given me and tried to ignore the sinking feeling in my gut. I almost turned around then, but I had driven all the way out there, and I needed those headshots. So I parked and headed inside. The front door creaked when I pushed it open, and I stepped into what could generously be described as a lobby. It was small, just a desk with a couple of old chairs. There was no receptionist, no signs or artwork, just a plain empty space that smelled faintly of mold. I was about to text Leo to let him know I was there when a door at the back of the room opened, and he stepped out. He was tall, maybe in his early 40s, with short hair and glasses. He was wearing a plain black t-shirt and jeans, and his demeanor was casual, friendly even. Hey Sophie, Wrighty said, walking toward me and extending his hand. Glad you made it. Come on in, the studio's just in the back. I shook his hand, my stomach still doing flips, but I smiled and followed him down a narrow hallway. The lighting was dim, 
and the floor creaked with every step. I kept glancing around, trying to take in my surroundings, but there wasn't much to see just old painted walls and a few closed doors. We reached the end of the hall, and he opened another door, leading me into a small room with a backdrop set up against one wall. There was a single overhead light and a camera on a tripod. It was basic, but I figured it would do the job. Go ahead and take a seat, Leo said, gesturing toward a stool in the middle of the room. We'll start with some simple headshots, and then if you're comfortable, we can do a few more creative poses. I sat down, trying to shake off the uneasy feeling that had settled over me since I arrived. He fiddled with the camera, adjusting the lens and checking the lighting. I watched him for a moment, and that's when I noticed something strange. There were no other photos in the room, no examples of his work, no previous clients, nothing. Just bare walls and that single camera. He must have caught me looking because he gave me this weird smile. I usually keep things pretty minimal in here, he said, almost like he was reading my mind. I find it helps people focus better. I nodded, not really sure what to say. The whole thing just felt a bit off, but since I was already there, I didn't want to look like I was freaking out. So I sat still and waited as he adjusted the camera and started taking a few test shots. At first, everything seemed normal. Leo clicked away, giving me directions like chin up a little or look off to the side. It wasn't until about 10 minutes and that thing started to get weird. Try loosening up a bit, he said after a few shots. Maybe take off your jacket. It wasn't a strange request considering we were doing headshots, but the way he said it made me hesitate. His tone had shifted slightly more insistent, like he was trying to push me out of my comfort zone without outright saying it. I took off my jacket, trying to keep things casual, but I could feel his eyes on me in a way that made my skin prickle. He started taking more pictures, but now his instructions were getting weird turn a little more to the side. Now tilt your head down, look back at me but keep your body angled away. I followed his directions, but something about the poses didn't feel right. They weren't headshots anymore, they felt more like something you'd see in a glamour shoot. And I wasn't prepared for that, I hadn't dressed for it, and I definitely hadn't agreed to it. You've got a great figure, he said, suddenly his voice low. Have you ever done anything more creative? Something a little more daring? That's when it clicked this wasn't just a headshot session. Leo had something else in mind, something he hadn't mentioned in his emails. The atmosphere in the room shifted, and my discomfort grew. I glanced at the door, realizing it was closed and the hallway outside had been dead silent. I tried to play it cool. Actually, I think we've got enough for today, I said, forcing a smile. I'm not really comfortable with going any further. Leo's expression didn't change, but his posture did. He stood a little straighter, his fingers tightening around the camera. Are you sure? We're just getting started. You'd be surprised how freeing it can be to step out of your comfort zone. I'm sure I said my voice firmer this time. I stood up, grabbing my jacket from the stool and moved toward the door, but Leo stepped in front of me, blocking the way. Just a few more shots, he said, his tone darker now. You came all the way out here, don't you want to make it worth your while? A sick feeling hit my stomach. I wasn't about to let this guy trap me in a room alone. I took a deep breath and squared my shoulders. I said, I'm done. There was a tense moment where neither of us moved. Then, without another word, Leo stepped aside, his smile never leaving his face. But there was something else in his eyes, now something that made my skin crawl. I left the room quickly, not bothering to look back as I walked down the narrow hallway. All I could think about was getting out of that building. When I reached the front door, I practically threw it open and stepped outside, breathing in the cool evening air like I'd been holding my breath the whole time. 
I hurried to my car, locking the doors as soon as I got inside. I just sat there for a moment, trying to take it all in. Leo hadn't touched me, hadn't done anything outright dangerous, but the whole thing had felt wrong the way he looked at me, the way he tried to push me into something I hadn't agreed to. It made my skin crawl. When I got home, I blocked Leo's number and deleted his emails. I didn't want to think about what could have happened if I hadn't stood my ground, if I had let him push me into doing more. I spent the next few days feeling uneasy, like I was being watched, but I knew it was just my nerves. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that Leo wasn't just some guy trying to take pictures there was something more behind his eyes, something darker. I reported the ad to Craigslist, but I never heard anything back. To this day, I wonder how many other girls had gone to Leo's studio thinking they were just getting headshots. Lucky for me, I didn't find out what he really wanted. Looking for a cheap used laptop shouldn't have been difficult, but after a week of scrolling through Craigslist, dealing with sketchy ads and people who ghosted me mid-conversation, I finally found what seemed like a decent deal. The listing was simple Dell laptop, slightly used but in good condition, priced at $200. The seller, Dave, had posted several clear photos of the laptop that looked legitimate, no weird reflections on the screen, no stolen images from a product website. The ad stated pickup preferred, but willing to meet halfway. That worked for me. I didn't mind meeting in person, as long as it wasn't too far out of my way. I messaged Dave, and he replied immediately. Hey, I'm interested in the laptop. Still available. Yep, can meet tonight if you're free. Let me know where you're coming from, and we'll find a spot in the middle. The quick response felt reassuring, though perhaps a little too eager. Maybe he just wanted to unload it quickly. We settled on a meeting place at 7-Eleven, just off the highway, halfway between our locations. It was a spot I'd been to before, well lit with plenty of people coming and going, so I wasn't too worried. We planned to meet around 9 p.m., which wasn't ideal, but I was ready to get this deal done. Before heading out, I got dressed, grabbed my wallet, and checked the cash two crisp $100 bills. As I drove, I kept having this nagging thought, why did I need this laptop so badly? Maybe it was the price, or maybe it was the feeling that I'd finally found something that wouldn't break the bank but could still handle the tasks I needed it for. Halfway there, my phone rang. It was Dave. Hey man, just wanted to give you a heads up, Dave said, his voice sounding rough, like he'd either just woken up or smoked too many cigarettes. I'm having some car trouble. I had to pull off the highway, but it's nothing major. I'm just down a side road about two miles from the 7-Eleven. I slowed down, taking in what he'd said. He gave me directions to a little side road that cut through some fields. I'll park near the entrance. You can't miss me, he added. You can check the laptop out, and if you're good with it, just drop the cash and we're set. Something about that seemed weird. Why not just meet at the 7-Eleven as planned? but I didn't want to blow the deal over something minor, so I agreed to head over. The further I drove, the more isolated it felt. The side road was narrow and graveled, lined with fields of tall crops on either side. It was late enough that there were no other cars, no lights, except for my headlights. I'd driven by plenty of farms before, but this place felt like it had been forgotten, no houses, no barns, nothing but endless rows of cornfields stretching into darkness. I spotted what I assumed was Dave's car, a beat-up pickup truck, parked just off the road at a slight angle. The headlights were off, and it looked like it had been sitting there for a while. No sign of movement. I parked a few feet behind it, leaving my car running just in case. 
My phone buzzed, hey, sorry, had to step into the cornfield for a second. Nature called. The laptop's in the car. Just drop the cash and take it. Should be good to go. There was something incredibly unsettling about someone lurking in a field. My instinct screamed at me to leave, but I wasn't ready to admit this whole thing was a bad idea. I stepped out into the night. The air was thick and still, with no sound except for the rustling of corn leaves. As I approached Dave's car cautiously, I kept glancing toward the cornfield, trying to catch any glimpse of movement. Just as I reached for the passenger door handle, I heard it a soft rustling from the cornfield. At first I thought it was just the wind, but the sound grew louder, more defined, like someone slowly making their way through the field. I backed up slowly, scanning the rows of corn. The rustling stopped, and for a moment everything went dead silent. Then I saw a figure emerged from the cornfield right behind me. They moved strangely, almost too smooth, like they were gliding through the stalks. My stomach sank. This wasn't some guy who just needed a quick bathroom break. I didn't wait to find out what was happening. I turned and sprinted back to my car. The rustling grew faster, as if whoever was in the field was now pursuing me. I threw myself into the driver's seat and slammed the door. My headlights flickered on just as I saw two figures standing at the edge of the cornfield, both staring at me motionless. I hit the gas and pulled away, repeatedly checking my mirror, certain I'd see those figures following me. They didn't, but it felt like I had just barely escaped something far more dangerous than a sketchy Craigslist deal. The road seemed endless until I finally saw the highway lights ahead. I felt immense relief as I pulled onto the main road, leaving the isolated farmland behind. I stopped at a diner a few miles down the road, my hands still shaking as I cut the engine. I sat there for a while, trying to process what had just happened. The figures, the car with no laptop had I been set up for a robbery or something worse. As soon as I got home, I blocked Dave's number. The next day I found a laptop at a pawn shop. Sure, it cost more, but at least I didn't have to meet someone in the middle of nowhere at night. I still think about those figures in the cornfield, standing there watching. I'm just thankful I didn't stay long enough to find out what they had planned. I'm Derek. And this is a frightening experience that happened to me about a year ago. I owned a high-end camera that I rarely used anymore. Although I had been passionate about photography, my schedule no longer permitted me to pursue the hobby. Since the camera was in excellent condition, I decided to list it on Craigslist, hoping to sell it locally and avoid shipping complications. Shortly after posting the listing, I began receiving responses. One particular individual named Dan caught my attention, though not for positive reasons. He initially offered less than half of the camera's value, which I found insulting and told him so. Despite my rejection, Dan persisted, sending multiple messages daily with various lowball offers. Eventually, he proposed a reasonable price, and I agreed to the sale. We arranged to meet at a subway station near my apartment. Upon arriving at the subway station, I immediately noticed three men waiting at our designated meeting spot. All of them were significantly larger than me, and their intense stares made me uncomfortable. Despite the knot forming in my stomach, I approached them, trying to maintain my composure. Hi, Dan, I said as I walked over. Hey, he responded with a smirk. I acknowledged each man with a nod, but their calculating gazes made me regret my decision to meet them there. An inexplicable tension filled the air, though I tried to suppress my growing fear. Dan asked to see the camera which I retrieved from my bag. Here it is, in great condition, just like I said I explained. 
He examined it meticulously, turning it over while his companions alternated their attention between the camera and me. After his inspection, Dan returned the camera to me. This isn't worth what you're asking for, he declared aggressively. My heart sank. Though I had anticipated this possibility, I had hoped he would honor our agreement. I'm sorry, but we agreed on the price already. I can't go any lower than that, I responded. The presence of the three men towering over me was incredibly intimidating. Their stance carried an unspoken threat. Dan moved closer, his face inches from mine. Listen, kid, I'm doing you a favor by even offering you this much. You should take it and be grateful. Feeling his breath on my face ignited my anger. I stepped back and straightened my posture. I can't go any lower. Take it or leave it, I declared firmly. Dan's expression contorted with rage. He lifted his shirt, revealing a gun tucked into his waistband. I felt paralyzed with fear as the other two men maintained their emotionless expressions. Now listen, Dan said, pointing at me. You're going to take the money that I'm offering, and you're going to hand over that camera. The situation had become terrifying. His companions had encircled me, their presence suffocating. Though I wanted to resist these bullies, the look in Dan's eyes revealed something more frightening than the weapon, a glimpse of genuine instability that suggested he would stop at nothing to get his way. Okay, okay, I surrendered, raising my hands. I'll take the money. They each took a half step back, bringing momentary relief. Dan handed me a wad of cash, which I quickly counted. Though it was less than half our agreed price, I knew I had to accept it and leave. I handed over the camera with deep regret, knowing I had been intimidated into submission. Back in my apartment, I struggled with a mixture of emotions, anger, fear, and disappointment. The reality that people could be so ruthless over money was disturbing. Looking at the money on my table filled me with disgust and shame, but I knew I couldn't let them get away with their actions. I contacted the police and provided detailed information about the incident. They listened attentively and promised to investigate. Several days later, they called to inform me that they had located Dan and his accomplices, along with my camera. Although they denied any wrongdoing, Dan agreed to return the camera in exchange for the money. While the outcome wasn't ideal, they should have faced charges for assault or intimidation, I accepted the arrangement. Even with potential surveillance footage, proving criminal intent would have been challenging. Sometimes the best course of action is to move forward and learn from the experience. This incident occurred when I was 18 years old. Although I had recently graduated from high school, I was still living with my parents. After purchasing a new computer and setting it up, I decided to sell my old one on Craigslist. The old computer was only two years old, but technology had advanced significantly during that time. It was a Dell computer with decent specifications that had originally cost nearly $2,000. Given the rapid advancement in computer technology, I listed it for $500. Shortly after posting the listing, I received a response from someone named Toby, who expressed interest but wanted to see the computer first. I suggested meeting the following week in downtown at a cafe, but Toby insisted on seeing it immediately. Despite knowing it would be safer to meet in public, I gave him my home address since I lived in the suburbs and didn't have a car. Looking back, it was both lazy and foolish of me. My parents weren't home at the time, and I naively assumed it would be a quick, straightforward sale without complications. Toby arrived that Saturday around 7 p.m. in an older van, accompanied by another man. Both men appeared to be at least 30 years old and were considerably larger than me. Their presence made me uneasy, but I dismissed my concerns, 
telling myself they were simply interested in the computer. I invited them into the kitchen, where I began demonstrating the computer to Toby. His companion asked to use the bathroom, and I directed him down the nearby hallway. I continued showing Toby the computer, which I had wiped clean and restored to its original settings. After about 10 minutes, I realized Toby's friend hadn't returned. Hey, what about your friend? I asked Toby. Don't worry about it, he replied. He takes his time, it's fine. As I listened carefully, I heard footsteps coming from upstairs, not from the bathroom area. Since we were the only people in the house, I knew it had to be his friend. There was no reason for anyone to be upstairs, as the bathroom was on the main floor. I began to panic internally, but tried to maintain my composure. When I casually inquired about his friend again, Toby's response chilled me. He placed his hand on my shoulder with threatening pressure and told me not to worry about it. His grip was painfully tight. In that moment, I realized this wasn't simply a sale gone wrong we were being robbed. This had likely been their plan from the beginning. Terror swept through me, but I struggled to stay calm. I told Toby they could take whatever they wanted and leave, but his grip on my shoulder only tightened menacingly. Shaking with fear, I knew I had to act quickly. I managed to break free and run to my father's office on the main floor, locking myself inside. I had foolishly left my cell phone on the kitchen table, but thankfully there was a landline in the office. My heart pounding, I called 911 and explained the situation to the dispatcher. Those moments waiting for the police felt like the longest of my life. I could hear the men moving throughout the house, presumably gathering valuables. They must have realized the police were coming because they suddenly fled the premises. After ensuring they had left, I emerged to assess what had been stolen. From the main floor, I noticed the kitchen television and the computer for sale were missing. Later, I discovered they had also taken most of my mother's jewelry and at least $200 in cash. The police arrived approximately 10 minutes after the robbers departed. Although they investigated briefly, they left without making any promises. Despite my follow-up calls, I never heard from them again about the case. When my family returned home, I had to explain what had happened. They initially thought I was joking, as I often have a dark sense of humor, but their amusement turned to anger when they realized I was serious. The total loss amounted to approximately $3,000, which represented an entire summer's worth of work for me at that time. Since the incident was my fault, I accepted full responsibility for the losses. This experience taught me a valuable lesson I never again met strangers from the internet at my home. Now, I strictly adhere to meeting in public places with no exceptions. Last year, I attempted to sell my 2007 Mercury Mariner. Despite its age and high mileage, the vehicle was in good condition and ran reliably. Based on previous positive experiences, I decided to list it on Craigslist complete with detailed photographs. The second day after posting, I received a text from a man who called himself Owl. He expressed immediate interest in purchasing the vehicle. Since I had set a fair price and lived in a large apartment complex, I felt comfortable sharing my address reasoning that he wouldn't be able to identify my specific unit among the many buildings. We scheduled a viewing for 9 p.m. the following day, after his work hours. Before his arrival, I thoroughly cleaned the vehicle. When the time came, I went to the parking lot where Owl soon arrived. He emerged from his car an intimidating figure, roughly six feet tall and 250 pounds, covered in tattoos. After exchanging greetings, I showed him the Mariner. He conducted a thorough inspection before requesting a test drive. We drove around the neighborhood 
and he expressed satisfaction with the vehicle's performance, leading me to anticipate a successful sale. However, upon returning to the apartment complex and parking, Owl unexpectedly announced he needed more time to consider the purchase. As I prepared to end our meeting, he made an unusual request to use my bathroom. Internal alarm bells rang immediately. His request seemed inappropriate and potentially dangerous. I firmly declined and began walking away, concerned this might be a premeditated scheme. The last thing I wanted was this stranger entering my apartment. Though Owl lingered near my car, I chose to enter through the building's front entrance rather than the side door. While approaching the entrance, I glanced back and noticed he had disappeared, which temporarily relieved my anxiety. I entered the building and took the elevator to the third floor. Upon exiting, I started walking left but froze when I spotted Owl emerging from the stairwell at the hallway's end. My heart raced as I realized he had followed me. Initially walking toward my apartment, I saw him approaching and quickly reverse direction. Suddenly I heard his footsteps break into a run behind me. I sprinted to the opposite end of the hallway and dove into the stairwell, descending rapidly. With Owl in pursuit, I fled through the underground parking garage, managing to gain some distance as I ran to the far end. His footsteps echoed behind me as I reached the opposite stairs, climbed to ground level, and escaped through the side door. I rushed to my car, jumped in, and drove away while calling the police. After circling nearby streets for several minutes, I returned to find Owl's vehicle still present, though he was nowhere visible. The police arrived promptly, and I waited for their escort before re-entering the building. To my shock, they discovered Owl attempting to break into another apartment. It became clear that his interest in purchasing my car had been a ruse his true intentions were likely robbery or worse. One time, years ago, I was in the market for a TV and decided to browse Craigslist. I often found great deals or even free items there, although caution was always necessary. Upon discovering a promising ad for a reasonably priced TV, I reached out to the seller, expressing my interest in purchasing it. Within an hour, I received a response from a woman named Joy, confirming that the TV was still available. She provided an address and instructed me to come over the following night to make the purchase. The address seemed to be in a nearby neighborhood, so the next day, I prepared the cash and headed there. Arriving around 7 p.m., I parked in front of the house, situated in what seemed like an average neighborhood. When I knocked on the door, it was swiftly answered by a woman in her 30s with dark hair. She welcomed me inside, apologizing for the mess of boxes strewn around the living room. Joy mentioned that the TV was in her bedroom and led me down the hallway. Opening the bedroom door, she gestured for me to enter. However, upon stepping inside, I realized the room was empty. Before I could react, the door slammed shut behind me, locking me in. It all happened so fast Joy hadn't even entered the room. I attempted to open the door, but it was locked from the outside. Confusion and panic set in as I knocked and called out to Joy, but received no response. After several futile minutes, I accepted that I was trapped. With no furniture in the room, I was left alone in an eerie silence, wondering what was happening outside the locked door. I grabbed my phone and attempted to call my friend, but I couldn't get a signal. That seemed strange. Trying to open the door and calling for help yielded no response. It became evident that nobody was coming to my aid. Puzzled and anxious, I scanned the room, wondering what was happening. After several minutes, I heard noises emanating from outside the room, seemingly from the living room area. It was Joy and a man conversing, although I couldn't discern their words. Despite yelling out, I received no reply. 
Frustrated, I tried to open the window, but it wouldn't budge, further fueling my anger. Returning to the door, I pounded on it fiercely, desperate to break it down. Suddenly, a man's voice from down the hallway shouted at me to stop. Unsure of what these people were capable of, I hesitated briefly before taking action. Retrieving my phone, I turned up the volume and played the most annoying alarm noise, placing it at the far end of the room. Concealing myself behind the door, I waited. Within moments, footsteps approached the room, and the door swung open, revealing the man. As he moved towards the noisy phone, I emerged from my hiding spot, darting past him and fleeing the room. He attempted to grab me, but I narrowly evaded his grasp. Racing down the hallway, I encountered Joy in the living room, who tried to impede my progress. Dodging past her, I reached the door, with the man now in pursuit. Swiftly unlocking my car, I jumped inside and sped away. Unfortunately, I had left my phone behind, rendering me unable to call the police immediately. Stopping at the nearest gas station, I entered and asked the employee to contact the authorities. When they arrived, we returned to the house, where my phone was found abandoned on the street nearby. The perpetrators were nowhere to be seen, and it was revealed that they didn't actually reside in the home it was rented by someone else. Unsure if they were ever apprehended, I discovered that the Craigslist post had been removed. After that harrowing experience, I vowed never to use Craigslist again. Roughly two years ago, I decided to sell my old phone on Craigslist after upgrading to a new one. The phone was only two years old and in good condition, so I thought it would attract buyers. After considering eBay, Facebook Marketplace, and Craigslist, I opted for the latter, prioritizing a quick sale over making a profit. Listing the phone at a reasonable price, I received a text message expressing interest within a few hours. The potential buyer, Molly, seemed eager so we arranged to meet the following day outside a local strip mall, conveniently located for both of us. When we met, the transaction went smoothly, and Molly purchased the phone without any issues. Everything appeared normal during our brief interaction, and there were no red flags. However, things took a strange turn in the days that followed. Molly began texting me, initially asking me to come over and then inquiring if she could visit my place. It was unexpected and out of context, considering our interaction had been solely about the phone sale. At first I wondered if she had the wrong number, but then she mentioned my name, indicating she was indeed contacting me intentionally. I had no interest in pursuing any further interaction with Molly beyond the sale, and her persistent texts which continued late into the night and into the next morning, left me feeling uncomfortable and confused. Once again, Molly persisted in her attempts to come over, ignoring my previous attempts to deter her. Feeling increasingly uncomfortable, I lied and told her I had a girlfriend, hoping she would take the hint and leave me alone. However, Molly disregarded my statement, insisting it didn't matter and continued texting me as if we were close friends, asking about my activities. Feeling bewildered by her behavior, I asked her to stop, but she became angry and started hurling insults at me. Frustrated and alarmed, I decided to block her, hoping to put an end to the unsettling situation. Little did I know, the ordeal was far from over. Later that same night, I heard a knock at my front door. Peering through the window, I was stunned to see Molly standing outside. How did she find out where I lived? It was alarming to think she might have followed me home. Reluctantly, I answered the door, intending to firmly tell her to leave. However, as soon as I opened the door, Molly launched into a tirade of curses and refused to leave. Growing increasingly aggressive, she attempted to enter my house. 
In a panic, I slammed the door shut and locked it, but she persisted, banging on windows and trying to force her way inside. Realizing I needed help, I called the police and waited inside. Molly continued her relentless assault on my home, banging on windows and attempting to open doors. Even when I tried to reason with her through a window, she remained undeterred. Thankfully, the police arrived and were able to intervene, putting an end to Molly's alarming behavior. Subsequently, I obtained a restraining order against her, as I couldn't comprehend why she fixated on me so intensely. I suspected drugs might be involved, but I couldn't say for sure. This experience served as a stark reminder to exercise caution when using platforms like Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace.